What if i was the square root of negative i? Instead of the usual imaginary number, the root of negative 1, we can define i in this recursive way, the root of minus i. And this means that it's also the root of minus root of minus i, and it's the root of minus root of minus root of minus i, and the root of minus root of minus root of minus root. A spinning root. spiral helps us understand this visually. We'll put it in a grid with a real axis and an imaginary ally. Then this spiral becomes a set of numbers. Let's square all the numbers using the usual i. The output is twice as spirally and twice as spinny. And if we use the third power, it's thrice as spirally and thrice as spinny. With the fourth power, it's quadrice as spirally and quadrice as spinny. This keeps going. The usual i works really nicely. That's why it's the usual. Switching to the recursive i, squaring gives us this droopy spiral and the third power makes this amoeba shape. Then with the fourth power, it's back to being droopy, and with the fifth power, it's back to being amoeba. It's giving me the heebie-jeebies. So clearly, this recursive imaginary is less nice than the usual imaginary. But what if we combine them so that i is the root of minus 1 minus i? and therefore also the root of minus 1 minus root of minus 1 minus root of minus 1 minus The spiral root. in this system gives a square that's not fully droopy, it's just oopy. But we can morph it into the droopy shape by changing the definition of i. Let's morph back from droopy to oopy, and then to the usual loopy. But why stop there? We can keep going. This one looks kind of spooky. Changing the definition of i kind of looks like we're rotating in 3D. But that's just with the square function. Morphing the cubic function is harder to understand, and it gets even more complex with other functions. In this video, we'll explore what happens when we define i to be the root of any a plus b. Let's return to the cubic graph and switch the input to a square. ka -chow! It's a lightning bolt. This form remains when we redefine i we still get some four-pointed shape. And the most symmetrical shape is here, where i is the root of 1. If you're a returning viewer, you may recognize this from my last video. If you're a new viewer, hello! Last time we talked about the split complex numbers, which have j as the root of 1. It turns out the split complex are squeakable to the recursive imaginary. Mathematicians use this squiggly equal to say that the two systems are the same in every meaningful way, but technically we define them differently. You shouldn't say they're equal because they're not exactly the same. That just wouldn't be correct, and you must be correct at all times. To see why these systems are squeakable, let's consider 1 plus 2i. If we square it, then do a little alge, we end up with 1. This number squares to 1. It acts the same as j. So we can convert the i into j by going two vertically and one horizontally. That's a knight's move! The split complex or squeak wool to the knight's move recursive imaginary numbers! To visualize this, let's start with the recursive, and we can morph into the split complex by changing the definition of i. Or instead, we can fix the recursive definition of i and apply a knight's move to the input and output. The effect is the same. We get that symmetrical shape. And it's not just this recursive definition. A bunch of other definitions are also squeakable to the split complex. As we morph the cubic graph, we always get this four-pointed output. These systems are just skewed versions of the split com- Wait a sec. Wait, do you see that? The shape is overlapping itself. Can we get a replay? Okay, so the shape is normal, just a four-pointed loop. Here, it crossed over itself. Now it's fundamentally different than before. These systems are not squeakable to the split complex. And this includes that mixed definition, the root of minus 1 minus i. This mixed imaginary system is actually squeakable to the regular complex numbers. Although now we have two different i variables. So let's make these ones oopy. i acts the same as 1 plus 2 oopy i over root 3. If we square both of them, then do a little alge, we end up with negative 1. These two systems act the same. All of these overlapping systems are squeakable to the complex numbers. Let's put a point to mark the value of i squared. 
When it's on the left of the screen, we get the overlapping complex. And when it's on the right, we get the no-overlapping splits. But interestingly, the border is not in the middle. We can move I squared slightly into the left, but the shape is still no overlapping. We have to go even further to become complex. So the border is somewhere over here. But it can't even be a vertical border. Back here, the shape is no overlapping, but by moving down, we turn complex. So what is the border? Let's figure it out. Given a definition of I, is it complex? We'll check to see if there's something that squares to negative 1. So let's distribute, then replace I squared with the definition. And now let's separate the real and imaginary parts of this equation. In the imaginary, we do a little alge and find that x is negative by over 2. So in the real equation, we can substitute for x, then do a little alge, and we find that the right arm side is less than 0. So that means the left arm side must also be less than 0. And therefore, a is less than a negative quarter of b squared. If this is true, then the system is complex. But if a is greater than a negative quarter of b squared, the system is the splits. So the border is where these two sides are equal. This equation makes a sideways parabola. The complex systems are to the left of the side parabola, and the splits are to the right of the side parabola. But what if the definition is on the side parabola? Then we're neither split nor complex. In this case, the system squeakles the duals, where epsilon squares to zero. The duals are the border. A great way to see this is the inverse function. In the complex, the inverse is contained. But if we move it to the duals, then it approaches infinity along a donkeyum tote. And if we move it to the splits, now there are two donkeyum totes. The behavior of this graph makes it clear which system we're in. And it's fun to look at the behavior of some other functions. You can do that yourself at this website that I made. Thanks to my recent supporters for helping me feel justified making this kind of extra content. I even created a game where you have to adjust I squared to match a target shape. It's pretty fun. So check out the site, enjoy the game,